Van Halen 1 is a once in a decade album that changed music forever. Just a couple of weeks ago, Eddie Van Halen passed away at the age of 65. It's been a rough couple of weeks for all of us Eddie Van Halen fans and the music community as a whole. Eddie was and is a musical legend. He's changed music in so many ways, pushing the limits of what was thought to be possible with the guitar. Today, we're going to dive into Van Halen 1, the self-titled debut album that changed everything. <laughs> Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome to this episode of Albums That Change Music. If you haven't already, please subscribe. If you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And of course you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Today, we're talking all about Van Halen's self-titled debut album, also known as Van Halen 1. We'll be talking about the history of the album, its impact, and taking it apart to see how incredible it is. To learn more about Eddie and how he specifically influenced guitar, please check out this video we recently released. It covers his technique, his tone, and how he became an unstoppable musical force. Rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. So let's break down this incredible landmark album. The first song, Running With The Devil, and this sound. So I was at Sunset Sound um, a couple of years ago. We took a school of kids there, a music school of kids there, who were between about 11 and 17 years old and re-recorded the whole of Van Halen 1. And I asked the studio, Sunset Sound, if they knew what that was. There had been this story that Van Halen would have this revolving horn, and that may well be the sound, but the um, studio manager at the time told me that in his recollection, they got a group of cars in a semicircle and recorded them with a mic. And it does sound like live car horns, but obviously you can hear the reverb that's added and it's slowed down. They probably put their hand on the tape or they, they did something to slow down the tape. So the whole thing's slowing down and they're adding verb to it. Um, however it was done, whether it is the... Cars in a semicircle, which I kind of like the idea of all the band's cars doing it. Or it is this, you know, spinning um, car horns that um, Eddie apparently had. It's just a great way to start a record. Next up, of course, is that signature sound of Michael Anthony's bass with the distortion on it. Have a listen to this. Now, if you listen to it closely, you can hear the bleed of Eddie's guitar coming through. So Eddie's amp was in one of the booths at Sunset Sound Studio One, and Michael Anthony's amp would have been in another booth. But it doesn't stop the fact that there is bleed coming through those walls. I mean, they were a gig volume. I mean, they were playing a proper rock show, and they're recording almost entirely live. What I love about this song is it's essentially one full performance all the way through. Eddie may have punched in and fixed some stuff, but it's just one guitar. And on the other side is the chamber, which is off, as you're looking into the studio, off to the left-hand side. And so you've got guitar on one side, chamber on the other. And there's just one guitar overdub. When the lead riff comes in, an extra rhythm guitar part comes in, and it flips to the other side. So here's the main guitar riff. And on one side, on the left, you can hear Eddie's guitar clearly, and then you can hear the chamber pan to the right. And then when that little lead part comes in, this beautiful hooky part comes in, it actually reverses. So that's an overdub. And then the rhythm guitar under that section just comes in just for that. Mm -hmm. 
Those two together, and we get this great section. So much energy. You hear like, you hear the strings in the nut, you hear the king. You hear when he's playing some rhythm parts and he's sliding around. It's just, he just knows how to bring energy to a guitar part. You know, so many people have commented since um, Eddie left us, not only was he one of the greatest lead guitar players that ever lived, he's one of the greatest rhythm guitar players that ever lived. So much groove and funk in that right hand. He could just lay back and make a track feel amazing. So here's the track sheet from Van Halen 2. Not Van Halen 1, but Van Halen 2. It's still valid because it was recorded in the same room. Both albums were recorded in the same room by the same engineer. And to the best of everybody's recollection, everything was recorded the same way. What I love about this is the mics that are being used on the drums are just not what you would expect anymore. We're so used to using large diaphragm condensers on everything as much as we can, and we make these assumptions that everything recorded in the 70s was done with a really expensive Neumann, and they were all over the place. Well, if we look at this track sheet here for the drums, what I love is that the kick drum has got a 546 in it, which is absolutely crazy. A 546 is like a cheaper version of a 57. It's a inexpensive, sure, dynamic microphone. The toms are 421s. The overheads are AKG 414s. The EBs still in Sunset Sound. If you want to go back there and track now, you can still use all these mics. And the snare was a pair of 546s as well. The hi-hat, it looks like it says AKG, it's a, I think it's a 451. So we've got a small diaphragm condenser on the hi-hat, and we've got three overheads, three 414s, toms with 421s, and a pair of 546s on the kicks. And it's interesting, because if you listen to the record, it doesn't have that modern kind of super low thump that you expect from like double kick drums that you hear now. It's a 546, it's a dynamic microphone stuck inside of a kick drum. So pretty modest miking for drums. Out in the room, there is one, one single U87. All the guitar amps are recorded with SM57s, and it's two mics on the cab. The bass is an RE20, and the DI would have been Sunset Sound's own DI. It's pretty darn simple. You know, you've got all of this breakdown here. There's nothing unusual about this. Everything is accessible. You know, the 87 is the most expensive microphone, 414's next, and then a whole bunch of dynamic microphones. So let's have a listen to those individual elements. Here is the kick drum. Pretty straightforward kick drum sound. Not a huge amount of low end. Then the overheads, which would be the three 414s. Oh. Just listening to the overheads is magical. It brings tears to your eyes. You can hear the bleed of the guitar coming into it. Because if you look at the layout of the room, the drums would have been in the corner. And so if Alex is facing out to the left-hand side is the vocal booth that they actually built for Jim Morrison, the sunset built for him. And that's where Eddie's guitar would have been. So it's cranked, it's got the sound he wants, and it's bleeding through the wall. But you can tell how much of this is really live. So have a listen to the snare on its own. Now, this is the snare with a 57 top and bottom. Now, it's incredibly likely that they gated this, obviously. They would have gated it, and that would have probably been the plate. You, if you listen to this record, you've got uh, effect on a vocal, you've got effect on a snare, and you've got the effect of the chamber on the guitar. And it's quite possible that they would have printed that, like, at mix stage, obviously, on the snare, and then printed it on the vocal, depending if they had access to different plates in the studio. Each room would have had its own plate, but sometimes if a band wasn't using a plate from another room, you could use their plate and your plate and your chamber. Just possible when they came to mix. But the really, the only effects on this record are the chamber on the guitar, the plate on the snare, and then a plate on the vocal. That 
is the whole sound. It's pure, magical Sunset Sound drum sound. Let's have a quick listen to the toms, which are also gated. And they are also printed, probably with a plate. So here is all of the elements of the drum kit together. It's just fantastic to think that this album is one of the biggest selling rock albums of all time. It sold 10 million copies alone in America. So worldwide, an absolutely massive, massive record. Do you think they ever imagined that going into Sunset Sound for a couple of weeks would have produced something so long lasting, so incredible? If you throw in guitars, bass, and drums, we get this. What I love about it is so fearless. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of reverb on that, a lot of plate, a lot of chamber, but it's fearless. And then if you listen to the vocal and you listen to David Lee Roth. I live my life like there's no tomorrow. And all I've got, I had to steal. Least I don't need to beg or borrow. Yes, I'm living at a pace that kills. I mean, it's everything that we love about the great rock vocalist. Completely theatrical. You know, it's larger than life. He just brings it. He brings emotion. He brings passion. He's got the screams. It's all there. Put it together and you've got some amazing magic there. So this formula of recording these mic layout was on every single song. The band came in as a well-oiled machine. They had been playing around Los Angeles for four years. They had been really honing their skills. So essentially, live tracks with a few overdubs. So what a great intro to Van Halen, that first song. But next up is Eruption. So there's just two moments of drums in this, two moments of bass, and a heck of a lot of amazing guitar. Here's the solo drums. And the second time the drums play. There's not much you can do about it. This wasn't the days of Pro Tools, so my guess is, is that intro was the intro. Maybe they did four or five takes like live together like that. And I'm, it's possible that Eddie could have punched after that and done all the note tapping section and done a couple of takes of it, a handful of takes. It's quite possible, but the reality is, is this whole section here with the drums, the bass, and all the initial guitar part would have all been live. I can't imagine trying to punch in and fix that. I'm sure Eddie, being such the perfectionist that he was, would have just wanted to do it as a take. When I spoke to him about using Pro Tools, he was shocked. He's like, I do everything on tape and didn't want to have anything to do with doubling parts. He was all about the performance. So let's check out the bass there. Hear all the guitar bleed. And then the second time. Chord. But this is the bit you probably really, really are interested in hearing. And here is the soloed guitar. <laughs> Listen to all of that bleed. So now you do know it was live. That's the bleed of all of the drums going into the guitar. Ted Templeman overheard Eddie noodling on what was to become Eruption and said it had to be on the record. It wasn't going to be on the record originally. Eddie thought it wasn't much. And now, of course, it is recognized as one of the greatest guitar solos of all time. 
So they've established themselves as a really solid rock band and unveiled their secret weapon. But in order to fully understand why this whole album is so incredible and what was so revolutionary, we need to take it all the way back to the beginning. Before the band Van Halen dominated the musical world, they were just a bunch of kids in Pasadena, California. Brothers Eddie and Alex Van Halen had started a few bands together. Eddie was on guitar and Alex on drums. In 1972, they were performing under the name Genesis. David Lee Roth had auditioned to be in the band, but Van Halen Brothers decided it wasn't a great fit. They quickly changed their mind after realizing that if he was in the band, they could use his sound system. In 1974, they added bassist Michael Anthony, changing their name to Mammoth when they realized Genesis was already taken. After discovering there was also a band named Mammoth, they decided to keep it simple and name the band after two of the founding members, Van Halen. The band then started playing around LA at clubs like Gazzari's, the Whiskey A Go Go, and the Starwood Nightclub. From 1974 to 1978, Van Halen played a tremendous number of live shows, honing their live performance and writing many songs along the way. Alex Van Halen explained. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how that developed? Yeah, by playing five hours a night, five days a week at different bars and clubs, sweating it out and um, so-called paying your dues. Yeah. We, we used to play about uh, yeah, five hours of really hard grinding rock and roll. No slow songs at all. And it just uh, it carried on over to uh, our original music. The band wrote, performed, and made a name for themselves around LA during those four years. But no matter how good they sounded, they kept getting turned down by record labels. They made a demo tape with Gene Simmons, but Eddie wasn't happy because they hadn't been able to record with their own equipment. And it just didn't feel like Van Halen. The band had spent four years honing their live show and writing songs, but were just waiting for the right opportunity. And that opportunity would come during a show at the Starwood Nightclub. How did you finally get a recording contract and, and, and break through into, you know, into, in, into the big time? We got discovered. The president of uh, Warner Brothers came down and saw us playing in a bar one night. We were playing for free. And he came with our producer, Ted Templeman, who, uh, who else does he produce? Oh, a variety uh, of Doobie artists. Yeah. Doobie Brothers, Little Feet. Right. And uh, they said, we want to sign you. So is, it, is it hard to break through, like for, for any group that just forms? And... Not if you're good. No. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, of course, is You Really Got Me. This song, as well, many, many, many of you are aware, is a song by The Kinks. It was a single off the record uh, and a great idea, even though, of course, the record is chock-a-block full of absolutely amazing songs. You know, it made sense to do this as a single, and I think it was a mainstay of their live show, particularly at the time. When I was a young kid and I saw them live, you know, horrible amount of years ago, um, I really looked forward to them playing the song live, and it was phenomenal. Just like every song on this record, guitar pan left, chamber panned right. Let's listen to the guitar in solo. <laughs> There's just something absolutely remarkable about this 22, 23 year old guy's right hand technique. Just absolutely spot on. I don't think I could edit something to sound that good. I mean, it's just so spot on, so tight, but with groove. You know, you could spend a lifetime learning to play like that. Here's uh, Michael Anthony's bass tone. Again, you can hear all the bleed and the drums. Again, the same miking as before. Again, 
Snare heavily gated. You can hear a little bit of bleed coming through there, but gated with that plate on it. You know, there's nothing more pleasurable than just listening to the overheads and just listening to everything that's going on in that room. It just reminds you of what great band this was. And of course, a bit of Dave's vocals. Girl, you really got me now. You got me so I don't know what I'm doing. Girl, you really got me now. You got me so I can't sleep at night. Girl, you really got me now. You got me so I don't know where I'm going, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, we cannot go any further on this record or any Van Halen record um, of this period and not mention Michael Anthony's background vocals. Absolutely superb. Every video I've ever done talking about Van Halen, um, whether it be the kids' breakdown, whether it's been recent videos we've done, everybody always brings up a very valid point. Michael Anthony's background vocals were absolutely superb. And it, there's a great juxtaposition between that sort of theatrical David Lee Roth kind of wow kind of thing that he's got going on and these very, very, really beautiful pitched, really full sounding backgrounds that have some air to them that fit around the growl, the natural growl of David Lee Roth. It's just a perfect, as people like to say, juxtaposition. You know, the way those two things work together is absolutely superb. So Michael Anthony, what a great background singer, of course, with Dave's incredible lead vocal. Van Halen set out to record their debut album in 1977, and producer Ted Templeman took a unique approach. Since Van Halen had spent years honing their live show and sounded incredible live, most of the album is tracked live, with the band in one room and David Lee Roth singing in the ISO booth. As bassist Michael Anthony recalls, we didn't have a ton of material, so we basically just took our live show, all the songs we knew, and went for it. The whole album took only a couple of weeks. Ted Templeman wanted to make a big, powerful guitar record, and we had all he needed in what Eddie was doing. Eddie Van Halen was also happy with Ted Templeman's production, stating, what Ted managed to do was put our live sound on a record. Sunset Sound was just a big room like our basement, and we played at stage volume. Van Halen is three instruments and voices, with very few overdubs. I hate overdubbing because it's just not the same as playing with the guys. There's no feeling there to work off of. So I'm sure you know, ain't talking about Love's guitar intro. I could listen to that all day. Just absolutely fantastic. So, just because you know I want to, let's have a listen to the overheads on this. Again, just bleeding into the drum mics. Absolutely fantastic. Here's David Lee Roth's vocals. I heard the news, baby. All about your disease. Yeah, you may have all you want, baby. Absolutely superb. And last but no means least, it's uh, listen to a bit of Michael Anthony's bass. I love the pretty aggressive compression on it, but it makes that attack, ping, 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 come through quite nicely. So you get a little bit of nose for the bass. It sort of sticks out, glues everything together and basically says, I'm here, love it. 
So as you can see from these breakdowns, there's very few overdubs. The album's recorded mostly live with great equipment, but certainly not crazy expensive equipment. It really goes to show how incredible Van Halen sounded just on their own. Ted Templeman's job as a producer was basically to make sure this record sounded like Van Halen. And he, of course, did an incredible job. Don Landy engineered it beautifully. Van Halen had developed into something really special, and Ted Templeman knew if they could make a record that captured that, Van Halen would be a huge success. Next up, of course, is I'm the One. Once again, his right hand is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we all love his incredible left hand technique, but the right hand that doing, I mean, that groove is completely infectious. It's got it's got like a funky chicken picking, you know, groove mixed in with something which is pure rock. Just unbelievable. So a couple of years ago, I got to work with an incredible group of young students. We re-recorded the entirety of Van Halen's first album, Sunset Sound. We used the same mics and the same setup as they have listed on the track sheets. I must say that something that doesn't come across in those videos is how generous Van Halen were. When they heard we were going to go back into Studio One and re-record the album in one day, both Eddie and Alex, both of them, gave all of the kids tons of stuff. They gave them signed posters for the last album they had done. Um, Alex gave them some of his sticks, which he also had signed. There was pics. There was just tons of incredible stuff. Every kid made out like a bandit. There was tons and tons of swag. And that's just how generous and supportive um, the Van Halen brothers are. Oh, Jamie's crying. Next up, Jamie's crying. All the same miking, the same instrumentation, the same panning. But let's take a little bit of time to listen to these backgrounds. Absolutely phenomenal. Oh, 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 Jamie's crying. Oh, 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 Jamie's crying. So unbelievably good. I love when you can hear where that gate isn't moving fast enough and you hear the bleed come through. I mean, that's how you get that snap on that snare. It's the gate opening and closing, going into a plate. That is the secret of that snare sound more than anything else. You can spend energy trying to mimic the mic micing of it, but you really need to get that gate. I wonder what it was in 1977. Who knows? It would be very interesting. I know that there's those little DBX mini gates uh, or the Valley People stuff that was in a lot of LA studios at the time, but it's certainly got a sound and it works stupendously well. If we go back and listen to the overheads, you can hear the full band playing together. Just such a great groove again. Love the kick in this. I mean, before the world of samples, <laughs> you just gated things to get rid of bleed in between. And uh, you had great performers. The incredible thing about Van Halen is how insane their lineup is. If you solo just the drums and the bass, it screams rock already. The foundation is so strong between Alex Van Halen and Michael Anthony, strong enough to support Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth. Most bands have a front man who looks good, performs well and draws your attention. But Van Halen had two front men, David Lee Roth, but also Eddie, basically the Mozart meets mad scientist of the guitar. It's a challenge to figure out how to balance everything, but producer Ted Templeman took a brilliant approach, borrowing from another genre of music. He said, when I listened to Ed within the confines of Van Halen, I had a visual of these two jazz legends playing with a piano or bass accompaniment. 
when they soloed, the piano and the bass dropped down in the mix and played a supporting role. I thought of Ed's solos in the context of Van Halen's instrumental attack the same way. That's why I wanted to feature his part so prominently on the record. My bebop chops allow me to understand Ed's playing and how to make Van Halen work on record in a way that a lot of record executives, the ones who passed on signing them, didn't. Van Halen was made up of a solid drums and bass, David Lee Roth's vocals, and the guitar god, Eddie Van Halen. And they're all incredibly dynamic performers. The fact that they managed to capture this energy on a record, and their debut album for that matter, is not just fair to anyone else. Van Halen are basically a supergroup right out of the gate. And debuting with Van Halen 1 is like starting with the greatest hits album. Another incredible thing about this album is that it was recorded in just 21 days. A testament to how musically tight Van Halen had become. And me, the Atomic Punk! Atomic Punk, what a great intro where he's just scraping the strings. The delay on it is absolutely superb. Eddie moving between phases and flanges and delays, right from the get-go, he was making albums where he was using pedals, he was using effects. His basic setup was simple. It was him and an amp, but he was using effects really creatively in a way that not many other people were doing at the time, which isn't really surprising because, of course, he was breaking down barriers with his guitar playing techniques. So, you know, it wasn't like he was just strumming an open chord and letting a flanger do something or a phaser. He was playing something with movement that was really exaggerated by phasers and flangers. Again, quick listen to the overheads. Just a reminder that this is all happening live in the same room. So what's interesting about this is that it definitely sounds like fingers. It doesn't sound like a pick. Got some tracks where he's obviously playing with a pick, probably to mimic it and get the same groove and feel as Eddie, you know, just hit it the same kind of way. But here, I'm just hearing that sort of alternating between two fingers on the right hand. That's definitely fingers for me. So that's cool. Obviously, Michael Anthony, amazing singer, extremely versatile bass player. We have to remind ourselves, they're four years in as a band by that stage, and they have been playing around town and doing everything they possibly can to get signed. And this is their big break. They go in a studio and they deliver. I am a victim of the science age, a child of the storm, whoa, yes. I can't remember when I was your age For me, times no more, no more Nobody rules these streets at night but me The Atomic Punk Oh yeah ah. Oh, love it. Everything we want in a rock and roll singer Just like complete over the topness and just like nothing held back Great vocal so one of the, I suppose, simpler songs on the record is uh, Feel Your Love Tonight. I suppose you could say that from a guitar player's perspective, but I love how Eddie brings in all these harmony notes. Have a listen to the riff. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if Thin Lizzy, you know, ever got to him, if you ever listened to some Thin Lizzy stuff, because there's just some real simple kind of ideas. The thing about Eddie's playing that I absolutely love is there's a huge, healthy dose of blues in there. And all of the technique that he has, which is arguably some of the greatest technical guitar playing ever, all feels like it comes from that kind of place. 
He plays things that are exciting and like rip your head off, but it doesn't sound like it's schooled. It sounds technical and exciting, but it comes from a dangerous place. When I hear Eddie play, I don't go, oh, there's that mode and there's, you know, that's a Mixolydian and oh, he went to a Dominican. I don't hear that. I just hear music. And I think one of the things that has always inspired me and so many other guitar players is that you can hear where it comes from, but you're just like, what? What is he doing? What is he thinking? It's always about excitement and energy and groove and feel. It's never about analysis. I can't imagine him sitting down and like analyzing people's playing in the way that we do now. He would just listen to it and get inspired and do his version and take it to the next level. It's, uh, I know he claimed that he had learned every single Eric Clapton guitar solo from Cream. I believe it. But he just took that, he took the blues, he took the groove and the feel of everything and just ran with it and added technique to it and excitement, which has, I don't know if it's ever been bettered. We have one last multi-track that we can listen to, and that is Ice Cream Man. And of course, it sort of rounds up what we were just talking about, about the blues. Obviously recorded in the same room. Let's go to the end of it when you hear Eddie's part turn into an electric. All right, boys. I mean, I rest my case. I rest my case. It's full of blues, and when he does show off his incredible technique, he doesn't lose sight of the fact that it's just, ah, it's exciting. It doesn't lose the groove, the feel, and just that middle fingerness, as I like to say. It's just, it's what rock and roll is all about. And there's no accident that for many of us, Eddie Van Halen is one, if not the most complete guitar player that ever lived. So when this album came out, it was a breath of fresh air. I mean, there was some incredible blues rock of the time, which we all loved. There was Queen, there was Brian May, there was so much great stuff. But this, this was like rock guitar on steroids. The energy on every single track is unbelievable. And when it came out, it just blew open the barn doors on rock. With the release of Van Halen 1, music was changed forever. It influenced so many other bands and artists, and every guitar player had a new, untouchable hero. Van Halen 1 is still one of the band's best-selling albums, and has reached not just gold, platinum, or multi-platinum status. Van Halen 1 is a diamond record, meaning it sold over 10 million copies. That's as high as the RIAA certifications go. Van Halen 1 launched Van Halen's world-dominating career, popularizing guitar tapping and bringing a new version of rock and roll into the world. Van Halen 1 is a once-in-a-decade album that changed music forever. 
Thanks ever so much for watching. Please subscribe. Please watch the other videos in this series, um, particularly the other Van Halen ones. And please leave some comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for watching.